This is the story of the evolution of life. So we're going to start our journey when the earth was very young. It's an amazing journey of how life evolved and how that evolution bioengineered the earth into the exquisitely balanced system that we see today. So we're going to learn a few things about you and me and our ancestors and how life made massive changes to Earth. So life is perhaps the most remarkable thing in the universe after the universe itself. So life is perhaps the most remarkable thing in the universe after the universe itself. So says Terence McCarthy and Bruce Rubich in this absolutely fantastic book called Earth and Life, The Story of Earth and Life, written back in 2005. So this is an absolutely fantastic book and I've borrowed quite heavily from it, but I would recommend it to you. I know it's 19 years old, but it really is an amazing story of what's gone on, particularly from a Southern African point of view. So pressing on. So here at the Dino Zone, we've spoken to some extent about dinosaurs, how they lived and how they died. So you can go and check all those other videos out if you want. There's a whole bunch of them of a lot of different kinds of dinosaurs and the Jurassic and the Cretaceous and the Triassic and all that kind of stuff. But now I want to go on another kind of journey and be a little bit more specific and a little bit more focused and take you right from the evolution of life right through those geological time periods when the pre-Cambrian, the Cambrian, when you had the Cambrian explosion, camels often sit down carefully, perhaps their joints creak. So that's the little mnemonic. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, camels often sit down. Carboniferous, if you're American, that's Pennsylvanian. Camels often sit down carefully. The Permian, then the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, which, which is the Mesozoic when the dinosaurs lived and then they went extinct 66 million years ago and then what's called the Paleogene. So I want to take you on that journey and uh, in a series of videos I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper rather than just skimming over the top of all this kind of stuff and talking about different kinds of dinosaurs which is great maybe for the younger viewers but um, being the scientist and the geologist and the paleontologist that I am I feel like I should get to grips a little bit more with this whole story of life and how it evolved. Okay so let's press on. So we're going to start our journey when the earth was very young. It's an amazing journey of how life evolved and how that evolution bioengineered the earth into the exquisitely balanced system that we see today. So the evolution of life has played a fundamental role. Also the evolution of the biosphere, the lithosphere and the atmosphere. So it's created an exquisitely balanced system as a result of that evolution. And so by understanding how these systems develop and how they operate, it allows us to, to make informed decisions on how to manage them and how to manage our or mitigate our impact on these systems. So um, from that point of view, I think we need to understand and dive into this kind of stuff so we have this broad appreciation of the evolution of these systems and how they currently keep our planet healthy and you and me alive. So I think that's pretty cool. So how did life arise? We just don't know. There have been several experiments, in fact, lots of experiments in laboratories trying to create life in the laboratory. And there's lots of theories of how life came into being. So we may look at some of these theories in another video. And if you want us to do those kind of videos, please uh, leave a comment in the comment section below. But at the moment, I'm just going to try and keep, keep things fairly simple. Well, it is going to be quite a complicated thing because we're going to dive into some biology here. So I'm not a biologist, but, but I'm going to try and explain some of this biology to you. So I'm going to try and keep it simple because it needs to be simple for me. I was starting to do Google searches and all this kind of mitochondria and evolution and DNA. And my goodness, it can get complicated. <laughs> so uh, that's not my thing. I've got lots of other complicated things I have to do in life. And so um, I'm going to try and make it as straightforward so you and me can understand it. So let's get going. So it's generally accepted by most scientists that life evolved about 4,000 million years ago, four billion years. And uh, just for the record, the Earth is four and a half billion years old. That's another story, how they work that out. So we might make a video on that, but uh, let's stay with the program here. So back then, Earth was covered mostly by oceans. Earth had an atmosphere. It was a very different atmosphere to what it is today. And that atmosphere comprised carbon dioxide, water vapor, along with some nitrogen and carbon monoxide. There might have been some other kind of minor gases lurking around. No one's quite sure. The moon loomed large in the firmament, 24,000 kilometers to 32,000 kilometers away. So for those of you who still into miles, that's 15,000 miles to 20,000 miles away. So compare that to the distance to where the moon is now. 
we're slowly losing our moon. It's moving further and further away in Earth's orbit. So ultimately, so ultimately, if we're around many millions of years in the future, we won't have a moon, which actually has huge implications in terms of life and the stability of the planet. But uh, we don't have to worry about that now. On the scale of our miserable short lifespans, we're going to be okay on that front. But anyway, so the moon is 383,000 kilometers away from us, or 238,000 miles. So 24,000 kilometers estimated, 24,000 to 32,000 kilometers to 383,000 kilometers. That's over a tenfold increase in the distance that the moon has moved out from the orbit of Earth and the time frames that we're talking about. Okay, so with the moon being so close in on the Earth, tidal ranges were very much higher than they are now. Meteorites winging their way in from outer space relentlessly pummeled the planet and the evidence for that is in the moon because that was also in the firing line so the moon is full of craters and earth was also full of craters but of course um, we had an atmosphere to protect it and of course for 4,000 million years we've had erosion and all sorts of earth processes that have actually um, covered up much of the original craters although there are a few still to be seen on the earth's surface. So we were in the firing line, we, had, we were pounded by those meteorites, and then the weathering of what little land we did have at the time added iron, silica, and calcium to the oceans, whilst hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor pumped out a whole lot more chemicals into the ocean. Iron, manganese, and sulfur. Surface temperatures were in the order of 50 to 80 degrees Celsius, and, and at times the oceans actually boiled. Atmospheric pressures were 30 to 50 times greater than that of today. The equivalent of being under 300 to 500 meters of seawater, which was enough pressure to crush a World War II submarine. It was a hellish place by all accounts. Certainly no green lush planet full of bounding life like we have today. So how did life arise? Well, let us first define life. So a quick Google search came up with two definitions. Encyclopedia Britannica, life, living matter, and as such, matter that shows certain attributes that include responsiveness, growth, metabolism, energy transformation, and reproduction. That's Encyclopedia Britannica. And Wikipedia has this to say, life is a quality that distinguishes matter that is biological processes such as signaling and self-sustaining processes from matter that does not, and is defined descriptively by the capacity for homeostasis organization, metabolism, growth, adaptation, response to stimuli, and reproduction. So thanks to Wikipedia for that. So for life to exist, a source of energy is required. And by extension, the precursors of life would also have needed a source of energy to kickstart the chemical processes that make life work. So the question is, what was the source of that energy? Natural chemical reactions give out energy, and the most likely place for these kinds of reactions would have been in hot thermal springs or down on hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. So in the latter case, water that's contained in the fractures that make up the ocean floor and the basalts becomes superheated by volcanic activity, and it flows out onto the ocean floor in what's called hydrothermal vents, and that dissolves oxygen-deficient compounds. This hot water laden with dissolved compounds reacted with the cooler, very slightly oxygenated seawater, releasing chemical energy, and in doing so, perhaps providing the energy necessary to kickstart life. And as you probably know, all life on Earth is carbon-based. Moreover, almost all life shares four basic molecules of chemical bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, linked together in a double helix which forms the blueprint of life, the genetic code, more commonly known as DNA. Now, I don't want to get in too deep here, but suffice to say, DNA stores the information that allows cells to replicate themselves, thus satisfying one of the requirements for life, namely reproduction. So all living things are composed of cells. These are little sacs which contain the chemicals of life as well as the DNA molecules we've just seen. And that holds the code which tells the cell what to do with the chemicals contained therein. The DNA given the instructions to replicate itself and the entire cell in which it resides. That's really quite amazing. And so speaking of codes, this is the fifth video of our keys to the dinosaur kingdom. So at the end of the video, I'm going to give you a seven digit number, which will unlock the amazing paleontological resources here at the Dinosaur for all the family to enjoy. So stick around to the end. And whilst I'm here, please subscribe, please share, please like. It's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for the algorithm. And what's not to like about that? All right, so I can hear that click going, click. All right, thank you for that. Fantastic. Great to have you on board as a subscriber. You're going to learn a huge amount about paleontology here, so it really does make sense. Okay, but I know you've already subscribed, so thank you. 
All right, let's press on. So let's talk about eating our distant relatives. Who were those two guys who sang that silly song, Eating People is Wrong? Donald Swan and something or other. Anyway, eating people is wrong. Anyway, we're going to be eating our distant relatives as we are going to see. So back to the origins of life. There is evidence to suggest that all life descended from a single self-replicating system. Amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA and RNA, and simple sugars come in two forms, right-handed forms and left-handed forms. And strangely enough, all living organisms use the left-handed form of amino acids and the right-handed form of nucleotides and sugars in their metabolism. This is too, too coincidental, suggesting that all living things, whether or not it is your pet cat, your goldfish, the salad you had for lunch, or you, all descended from a single self-replicating system. So give that salad that you're having for lunch some love when you chew on it. You may be eating a distant relative. It also suggests that life arose only once and kept on going. You, me, and your dog are the end members of an unbroken life stretching back nearly 4,000 million years. Our distant ancestor was a self-replicating organism that possibly arose in the Archean Ocean, perhaps at a hydrothermal vent on an ocean floor distant in both time and space from us now. That ancestor is called Luca, L-U-C-A, the last universal common ancestor. By the way, one of our early hominin ancestors, Australopithecus afarensis, was nicknamed Lucy by her discoverers. Luca and Lucy, ancestors both. Maybe we should do a video about Lucy too. I'm trying to stick with paleontology, not paleoanthropology. I'm trying to stay away from that, but maybe that is scope for some other videos later on once we've got through dinosaurs and all those kind of things. All right, so let's press on. So cousin, now that we share a common ancestor, let us be friends and go for coffee. If we can't manage that, at least subscribe to the channel as it will assist greatly in keeping the family together. All right, so we're looking forward to having you here as part of the greater family of life. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, please subscribe. I keep on saying this, eh? So how life began, no one really knows. In a very famous experiment carried out in 1952 by Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, thought to be the components of the early atmosphere back then, were placed in a glass flask and subjected to mini lightning bolts in the form of electric sparks. Once done playing Zeus, they then analyzed that soup that was lying in the bottom of the flask and they found it was full of amino acids, which hadn't been there before. And amino acids are the basic building blocks of protein. So that was an amazing, amazing result. And that's why this experiment has been so, well, it's been replicated and it really was quite a famous groundbreaking thing. By the way, Zeus was the god, the Greek god who was the god of all the gods. And his symbol was a fistful of lightning bolts. Maybe I need to animate that, eh? He lived on top of Mount Olympus and meddled in the affairs of men and his fellow gods. Anyway, that's another story. We're not into Greek myth. Well, we're into Greek mythology, but this isn't the place for it, right? So here's to Zeus and lightning bolts and uh, creating life in the oceans 4,000 million years ago. There's also another theory that clay may have provided the lattice or template in which the organic molecules were able to replicate themselves. So clay is an amazing substance. It's a basket name for several different types of minerals, names like montmorillonite, kaolinite, illite, smectite, and so forth. And the thing about clay is that they're able to replicate themselves. So they exhibit some of those features of living organisms. So maybe there was some, dare I use the word, symbiotic relation between clays and these organic molecules that assisted in kick-starting life. And there's a theory about that, and we can maybe make another video about that. So leave your comments if you want to hear about those stories. Leave your comments below, and um, I'll give that some consideration. So, so no one's been able to come up with a good theory exactly how life evolved, but Francis Crick of Crick and Watson fame, the two guys who essentially wrote the paper on DNA back in the 1950s, I think 1953, they came up with the structure of DNA, which we spoke about earlier. Um, along with a bunch of other fantastically good scientists. Um, but he came up with the idea that life might have arrived on Earth from outer space, a theory known as panspermia. But it still begs the question, how did life arise? Whether it did in, on our Earth or somewhere else in the universe, in the galaxy, in the solar system, we don't know. But it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a big question, but it doesn't really affect the outcomes ultimately. Once life had begun, it was it was going, so to speak. So wriggling into life, although we cannot bolt down the origins of life and certainly haven't managed to recreate it in the laboratory, we do know a great deal of what happened after that first long chained molecule wriggled into life. 
The most primitive form of life is a group of bacteria known as the archaea. They are single-celled organisms without a nucleus, known as prokaryotes. They occur in a wide variety of habitats, including hot springs and the deep oceans where they live around hydrothermal vents along mid-oceanic ridges in today's modern oceans. Some are able to stand very acidic conditions, others live in highly saline, very salty conditions, and some live oxygen-poor, methane-rich environments. Most can tolerate oxygen-poor environments, which is not surprising as they evolved way back in the Archean when oxygen levels were almost non-existent in the atmosphere and in the oceans for that matter. They, like us, have a need for copper, zinc, cobalt, nickel, molybdenum and selenium, which are used in the manufacture of proteins. And these elements are to be found in the hot element-rich waters around hydrothermal vents. Another form of bacteria, the eubacteria, evolved from archaea early in life's history. They are very similar to archaea, although they may have slight differences in their DNA. They love heat and probably evolved in hydrothermal springs too. And so these are important in the history of life, for it is they that invented photosynthesis and the process of denitrification. I remember going on a trekking trip to the high Himalayas. I don't know, we were up over 5,000 meters. So up there one evening we were cooking couscous and... Um, we had uh, water and we were, what's the word, we were purifying the water with iodine, iodine tablets. And so we mixed up the couscous in the water and we boiled it up and it all turned purple. And what's going on here? And then it was really interesting because on that trek was one medical doctor, two PhDs in biology and, and a geologist. And we all looked at them and said, you know what's going on here? That was an experiment we did back in grade seven, or th I think it was, when we you test for carbohydrates with iodine when you were doing a test in the lab about photosynthesis. Anyway, that's a little, a little aside. I've got here some leaves. We've just plucked them off the trees. So these were photosynthesizing up to the minute when we plucked them from the, from the branches. I'm sorry, leaves, we've kind of killed you here, but they might still be photosynthesizing, but it's not putting any energy into, into the plant, All right? So. Let me tell you a little bit about photosynthesis. So that is real magic. So the eubacteria invented the thing called photosynthesis and the process of denitrification and the fixing of nitrogen. So these processes caused a revolution in the development of life and furthermore drove another kind of revolution in the physical makeup of our planet, as we shall see. So taking a closer look at photosynthesis, if you want to see magic, photosynthesis is probably as close as you're going to get. It is the powerhouse of almost the entire global ecosystem. So without photosynthesis, you and I would not be here. So photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water and it combines them to make carbohydrates. So bread is carbohydrate, potatoes are carbohydrate, rice is carbohydrate, maize is corn, call it what you will, carbohydrate. Yeah, wheat, all those, all those products that, we, that supports our modern lives and human beings and m many animals beside. And so, Carbohydrates are produced through photosynthesis and the waste product is oxygen. So carbon dioxide and water are very happy to hang out together, but they don't react unless you throw in some photosynthetic magic. And the energy that drives the process is sunlight, which is captured by chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is in the leaves. That gives the leaves their green color. So that's an organic, a complex organic molecule. And I'm going to show you a picture here of, of the chlorophyll molecule. Pretty complex, as you can see. So chlorophyll makes plants green and occurs everywhere from the boreal forests of the Arctic to the rainforests of the tropics and the broccoli on your dinner plate. So next time you see a plant, give it some love for it and all other plants is keeping us alive. Cyanobacteria in the oceans took the carbon dioxide and water and made oxygen, taking up the abundant sunlight that bathed the earth and the UV-rich light back in the Archean. And as the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, colonized the world's oceans, vast quantities of oxygen were pumped out into the atmosphere as a waste product. We may think that oxygen is wonderful stuff because we needed to live, but it was a poison to the other bacteria that back in the day shared the world with those pesky cyanobacteria that insisted on behaving in such an antisocial way. The fossil evidence shows that cyanobacteria were around 3.8 billion years ago and their remains are to be found in the Cherts of the Barberton mountain land in southern Africa, a place where some of the oldest rocks on earth are to be found, and also in the Pilbara region in Australia, which is another famous locality for some of the earliest evidence of life on earth. 
So as the oxygen levels increased, some of it was used up by dying cells to form carbon dioxide. But there were other oxygen scavengers out there too, this time non-organic ones. Iron and manganese, which were dissolved in the ocean thanks to the weathering and, the, and that hydrothermal activity that we saw earlier, reacted with the oxygen, causing them to precipitate out onto the ocean floor. So precipitation, it's rain, the rain comes down. You also, when you get chemical reactions in, in a beaker or in the laboratory or in the oceans, you get the stuff flocculating or reacting and you get all the little particles sinking all the way to the bottom, just as rain falls until it ultimately hits the earth or your roof or your umbrella or whatever it happens to be. So precipitation, eh? So it caused the iron and the manganese to precipitate out onto the ocean floor. This led to the Great Oxidation Event, which I've written about in one of my blog posts on the Dinozone website. So the rocks that formed from this oxidation of iron in the seawater formed banded iron formations, banded ironstones, banded iron formations as the geologists call them, or BIFs, B-I-F-S, <laughs> BIFs. And a source of much of the iron ore which we need to make the steel that keeps the wheels of our modern day turning. So I've got a lump of banded ironstone here. So this is iron ore that gets mined and it gets put into a smelter and out comes pig iron, which then gets refined into steel. I've got a better example at the Dinozone, but you can see alternating bands of chert and iron. So that's a more spectacular example. So if you want to see that, I'll try and put a picture up here in this video of that, but uh, you're not going to see me holding it up and talking to the camera with it. But this is banded ironstone, and that other one is a more spectacular one, and that formed back in the day when we had this great oxidation event and iron settled out onto the ocean floor, thanks to all that oxygen that was pumped into the atmosphere by the cyanobacteria. Let's put that down. So there's some kind of bioengineering taking place. The Earth's atmosphere, if you remember, was carbon dioxide, a bit of carbon monoxide, water vapor, and what was the other one? Nitrogen. And now we're getting this massive influx of oxygen into the atmosphere, which starts to change the world. But there's more magic to behold. Remember that the early atmosphere was rich in carbon dioxide and that the atmospheric pressures were enormous, enough to crush a World War II submarine. However, carbon dioxide was slowly being removed from the atmosphere, firstly by photosynthesis and secondly by the precipitation of calcium carbonate into the oceans. The oceans to this day are sink for carbon dioxide. So in terms of global warming, if we give it enough time, the oceans will absorb all that CO2 that's been pumped out by our modern day societies. But that's another story which I'm not going to get into now. So the oceans are also full of dissolved calcium. And when they react, they form calcium carbonate or calcite. So you probably can't see this very well, but here's a piece of calcium carbonate or calcite. It's as clear, it's almost as clear as glass. And um, I've got a massive chunk of this sitting in the dinosaur park and I've got even bigger pieces of it, not anywhere near as clear as this, which gets used or gets crushed up to make cement. So if you want to see those, you better come and visit us at the dinosaur park, also the Rock and Sky Geo Center. So there's amazing stuff. But this is clear calcite. This very clear version is called Icelandic Spa or Iceland Spa. So when this stuff reacts, calcium carbonate is formed between CO2 and calcium. This stuff's barely reactive. Hey? You can drop this into water and it's pretty stable. So it's barely soluble in water or anything else for that matter, except in an acid and then it will dissolve. So calcium was constantly being added to seawater, again from that great source of elements, hydrothermal vents, as well as from the weathering of the newly formed continents. You must remember back in the day, the extent of the continents wasn't anywhere near that of what they are in the present day, for a whole bunch of geological reasons, which I'm not going to get into here either. But as the continents continued to increase in size, so did the supply of calcium, which then reacted with the carbon dioxide, as we've already seen, massively reducing the concentrations in the atmosphere. So life was the mediator of this process, as photosynthesizing organisms remove dissolved carbon dioxide from the water, leading to the precipitation of calcium carbonate or calcite. So one of the effects of this was the formation of stromatolites, which are now preserved on the ancient rocks of Barberton and elsewhere. So back in the Archean, this calcium carbonate precipitated onto colonies of cyanobacteria, which occupied the same ecological niche as the corals of today. And as the precipitation took place, the cyanobacteria were forced to grow up through that layer of calcium carbonate and over time a stromatolite was was formed this layered structure that was built from biological activity and the precipitation of the calcium carbonate 
And we've got a picture here of a very fantastic example of a stromatolite. We still get stromatolites in Australia. They're growing in a place called Shark Bay where there's no or very little biological activity that eats that kind of cyanobacteria. So well done to the Australians for preserving some ancient life there. And whilst all this was going on, nitrogen in the oceans was being taken up to make proteins by the cyanobacteria and released into the atmosphere as a gas by denitrification. And so the Archean was witness to the greatest revolution in Earth history as carbon was stripped out of the atmosphere to be replaced by oxygen and to some extent nitrogen. Cyanobacteria reached their peak between 2400 and 2600 million years ago during the widespread deposition of the Biffs, the banded einstones and those carbonate rocks. Where I am and here in South Africa we have huge deposits of Biffs and carbonate rocks in what is known as the Transvaal supergroup. Oxygen levels continue to rise throughout this entire period. So now for something entirely different, kind of different, oxygen reacts with everything. It makes things burn, it makes things rust and it turns us into compost when we die. Its reactiveness allows it to release huge amounts of energy and so some bacteria took advantage of this new source of energy, evolving the ability to breathe the stuff. How cool is that? These were the purple bacteria. Then a new type of life evolved in the form of eukaryotes, taking advantage of the oxygen and the purple bacteria. Remember the prokaryotes, those cells without a nucleus? The eukaryotes now got one up on the prokaryotes as they acquired for themselves organelles. No one knows how this happened, but one theory is that due to the environmental stresses imposed by the rising oxygen levels and falling carbon dioxide levels, the archaea began to hang out with the purple bacteria, with the archaea eventually absorbing the purple bacteria into their cell membrane. The purple bacteria then kept the oxygen levels low inside the archaea and supplied carbon dioxide and in return it got fed. This is known as symbiosis and it was a match made in heaven. The two organisms exchanged genes and the purple bacteria became the mitochondria that provided the energy needed for the both of them. These symbionts eventually became the ancestors of animals and fungi. A similar process may have taken place between early mitochondrial bearing cells and cyanobacteria to give rise to chloroplasts, which is where the magic of photosynthesis takes place. And the ancestors of plants are to be found in the primitive algae that developed from that union. So the oxygen crisis was the driver of the rise of mitochondrial and chloroplast bearing cells, opening up the way for the evolution of multicellular higher forms of life. The anaerobic bacteria, which had been the bosses of the Achaean, were forced to find a home in places where oxygen could not reach. The final story of our newly minted oxygen rich atmosphere then played out. Earth back in the Archean was bathed in harsh ultraviolet sunlight. And as we know, UV light is not good for us and all the other animals that live on this planet because it leads to cell damage. And so the atmosphere now rich in oxygen became filter for this radiation. So the oxygen molecules and then in its natural state comprises two atoms of oxygen, O2. So when it's subjected to UV radiation, that those two those two atoms break apart, the molecule is broken apart, and it becomes two highly reactive oxygen atoms, which then react with another oxygen atom to make a form of oxygen called ozone. So ozone has got three oxygen atoms, O3. When an ozone molecule is then struck by high energy UV radiation, it reverts back to an oxygen molecule, freeing up a single highly reactive oxygen atom, which then combines again with another oxygen molecule to make more ozone. And there's this ongoing cycle of the destruction and creation of ozone. And um, this amazing mechanism absorbs much of the UV radiation that comes piling in from our sun. So this isn't so important when you live in the ocean. Cyanobacteria, archaea, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, doesn't really matter. But when you're trying to colonize the land or the intertidal zone, being washed in bright UV radiation isn't conducive to those kinds of adventures. So the fact that the UV was filtered out by ozone, thanks to all that oxygen in the atmosphere that came from that blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria way back in the Archean, that was a bit of biological engineering that took place, which plays out in all our lives because otherwise we wouldn't have that filter. And I remember the big issues back in the 1980s. There was a hole in the ozone and uh, all those hydrofluorocarbons that were in those aerosol cans that we sprayed under our arms and did all that other stuff with. They banned those hydrofluorocarbons and the same things were in the fridge, the propellants in our refrigerators. So um, you know, we are very aware of the effects of having no ozone in the atmosphere. It's going to be not great for our long-term existence. So we also need to pay the same attention in terms of all the other environmental issues that are now rearing their ugly head thanks to our human activities, really. 
So we've come to the end of this journey. The scene is now set for more adventures in the evolution of life, which eventually brought us to the dinosaurs and then ultimately to us. It may seem to have been a bit of a complicated journey. So I made a PDF for you to download with some of the salient points of the journey outlined. And you can download that by clicking on the link in the description below. But well done to you for sticking it out through to the end. Earlier on in the video, we spoke about the keys to the kingdom and uh, giving you the numbers as part of the combination that is going to unlock the gate to the to the dinosaur kingdom. So those numbers are, you get your pen now, are 3411561. 3411561. So write those down. There's also a PDF that you can download with the list of all these 10 videos. And um, it's got the number, the name of the video, and then the code. And you can just fill it in once you've collected all 10. We'll send out the instructions as to how this is going to work and how you can get access to the dinosaur kingdom. Hey, eh? how cool is that? And for the sake of keeping the family together, please like, please subscribe and share this video to the other descendants of Luca that you may know. Right, I'm out of here. Until next time, take care and we'll see you on the next one. Bye.